الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So insha'Allah ta'ala the topic for today's discussion is going to be regarding the heart the eighth heart and this topic of the heart there is many angles for one to speak about it there's many many ways for we us to speak about this topic there's a way that we can speak about it from the angle of what is the heart what are the types of hearts what's the type of heart that's going to be saved on the day of judgment qalbun salim what does salim mean what is what is salim mean and many other ways however the way that I wanted to discuss it, and really and truly, and I'm going to be very honest, this topic, I prepared it for myself. I prepared this topic for myself. I prepared it so I myself can benefit before you guys can benefit. So I prepared it so that it's a reminder for myself first, and then a reminder for yourselves. So before I begin, I'd like to make the dua of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, where he said, اللهم اجعلني خيرا مما يظنون Oh Allah, make me better than what they think of me Some of you might think I'm something Allah, I'm just like you guys, normal Nothing So this is a reminder for myself And what I say today is not a reflection of how good my heart is Rather, it's a reminder for myself to improve myself first May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for what you don't see of my sins That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden That's the first point The second point is That The virtue of knowledge is actually better than the virtue of worship Knowledge or seeking knowledge is better than worship If we're just praying Maghrib here, right? And Aisha is going to come in a few hours. Between Maghrib and Aisha, if somebody stands up on this masjid and they start to pray two raka, two raka, two raka, nawafil, mutlaqa, just general nawafil, and they pray the rawat and the two of the sunnah, which is after Maghrib, and they do many acts of worship, reciting the Quran, and there's another group of people who are seeking knowledge. The scholars say the person who is seeking knowledge is a better in virtue than the one who is. Worshipping Allah. Why? Why? You mentioned the one who can attend Sunnah while seeking his obligation. Not really quite the answer. Why is knowledge more important than worship? You need knowledge to worship. You need knowledge to worship. Any other answers? Any other ideas? The scholars say, a ibadah that is muta'addiya, a ibadah that the benefit goes out to other people is better than a ibadah that is qasira. There's an ibadah that is specific to you. When you recite the Quran, who's benefiting? Just yourself, right? When you um, pray, pray your salah, your nawafil, who's benefiting? Yourself, only. But when you seek knowledge, not only do you benefit because you act upon this knowledge and you spread this khair to others, you might teach it to others. And the benefit exceeds just yourself. So the benefit is not to you only, but it's also to others. So that's why knowledge is more superior than any act of worship that is a nafil. Not the faraid, but it's for the nafil. And Imam al nawawi in his muqaddimah of the Kitab al majmur which is the shah of al muhaddad Manu al-Shirazi. This kitab, at the beginning of this book, he mentions this point and he establishes this point with evidences. Also, an example of this from the Salaf is Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, he went to meet Abu Zur'at al-Razi. Who is Abu Zur'at? Isn't Abu Zur'at? Have you heard of Aqidat al-Raziyin? The Aqidat of the two Razis? No? These two brothers, Abu Hatim al-Razi and Abu Zur'at al-Razi, the two brothers. And then from the Aima, from the scholars of Islam. Abu Zur'at al-Razi, he is the teacher of 
Bukhari. Imam Bukhari's teacher. And not only that, he is also Imam Muslim's teacher. The two most authentic books that we have today, who is the teacher for them? Abu Zurat al-Razi. He is the teacher of these two scholars, Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim. He's their teacher. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, when he went to Baghdad, where Abu Zurat al-Razi was, they said that he did not spend any time except he was seeking the knowledge of hadith. He did not pray one single nafil salah. One voluntary salah he did not pray. The whole time he was there. Because he was busy himself in what? Seeking knowledge. And we say seeking knowledge is higher than just praying no, I feel like that. Or reciting the Quran, etc. That's the second point. Then we want to mention the point is that we need to change ourselves, right? And we hear many people say, give speeches. We have one guy comes, he gives a speech. Second person comes, he gives a speech. Third person comes, he gives a speech. The Imam comes on Jum'ah, he's giving a speech. A brother comes, he gives you a reminder. Another brother comes, he gives you an advice. But lots of the time that we don't change ourselves. We don't change ourselves. Why? A lot of it is to do with the heart. That's why we're talking about this topic of the heart. We want to fix our heart so that we can change. When we listen to something, it will change our life for the good. This is why we want to talk about this topic. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيْرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيْرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah will not change the situation of the people unless they change their own situation. And we see everything around the world. All of us know what's happening, right? We know the difficulties that Muslims are facing, humiliation, prosecution, death, killings of Muslims, everything, we can see it. It's in the news. But Allah says, Inna Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin. What's ma mean? What does ma in this ayah mean? Allah does not change the situation. Ma biqawmin. Any idea? Is there another place Allah mentions ma like that? Inna Allah la yastahi an yadriba mathalan ma ba'udatan. It's for qilla. To show a little bit. To show the very least. Allah gives two examples of change here. Inna Allah la yagayru ma biqawmin. Allah does not change. So one change is from Allah. The second change is from yourself. Allah says, if you make a small little change in you, I will make a big change for you. Allah will give you a big change if you change a little bit of yourself. So all you need to do is what? Change a little bit of yourself and Allah will give you lots of change, inshaAllah ta'ala, in the community and in the ummah, inshaAllah. So, تغيير, to change. And the reasons that people reject change is three things, and three things only. A person will reject change for three things. The first reason is أَن يَكُونَ الْخَبَرُ عِنْدَهُ كَذِبًا that the khabar, when he listens from somebody, he believes is false. The imam will come and he will speak and you think what the imam is saying is not true. And that's why you don't believe in it. You don't believe in it because you don't trust him. You don't trust what information he's giving you. That's the first reason. But I don't think anybody here will ever say, I'm coming to a masjid, I'm listening to the speech of Allah, I'm listening to the hadith, and I, don't, I believe it to be not true, right? Every one of us thinks I'm saying the truth, right? If I say, Allah said, Muhammad sallallahu said, it's the truth. So this is not the case. The second case is, That you believe that what I'm saying is true. However, this news does not concern you. For example, if I said, there is an ambassador, or there's a, there's a, governor or mayor in this and this state in America today, he died. What I'm saying is truth, but does it concern any one of us here? No, he's in America, why do we care, right? So that's the second reason. The news that I'm giving you is true, it's 100% true, but it doesn't concern you. And most of us is, are falling under this category. The Imam is talking about riba. Allah has made halal uh, buying and selling, riba is haram. He, be he believes that this news does not concern him. He is, his house is not a mortgage. So when he hears the ayah of riba, what does he do? He closes his ears. He doesn't care about what you're saying. 
It doesn't concern him at that point because he himself is taking a mortgage. He's taking a river. He's got a riba, he's got an interest saved, everything. So the news that you're telling him is true, but it doesn't concern him. That's the second reason. A third reason is that the news you're telling him is true and it concerns him as well. But there is something that concerns him even more. And a lot of people also fall under this. They don't benefit from a lecture. They don't benefit and they don't listen to something that does not impact them, it doesn't change them. Why? Because the news is true and it concerns them, but they have something that concerns them more. I'll give you an example. Imagine there's a guy, he's on his balcony. While he's on his balcony, he's, he has a group of sheep. that They're flocking and they're eating from the farm. And he's looking at the sheep from far away and he's saying, you know, my sheep are doing good, alhamdulillah. All of a sudden, a car comes and crashes and kills his sheep. This news of the sheep dying, his own sheep, is it truth? Yes. He saw it with his own eyes. Does it concern him? Yes. It's his sheep and they died and now he does not have any sheep. But as soon as this happens, his wife calls from outside and she says, Ya fulan, inna abaka qad mat. Oh fulan, your father just died. What has happened? He has gotten a news that is bigger and concerns him more than the news that just happened. Meaning, a lot of us, we hear a lecture, we're in the lecture, we listen to it. And we're benefiting. And the news concerns us. It's about knowledge, and we know knowledge is important, and it concerns us, it's something important. In the West, we need this knowledge. But, what happens? His mind is in the dunya. He's thinking, what am I going to eat after the lecture? What am I going to go home and do? What movie am I going to watch? He's concerned with the dunya. The news is true. What the Imam is saying is true. The, the person giving the reminder is true. And it concerns him, but his brain is concerned with something more than that. That's the third reason why people do not benefit when they hear a lecture. And all of this really and truly goes back to the heart. It goes back to the heart. It has nothing to do except with the heart. And we know the statement where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said, Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. Indeed, the righteous people are in joy. And I found a very good benefit in Al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he mentioned. He said, Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. He said, Mukhtar. It is incorrect. Or a person who is believing this is incorrect. That Inna al-abrara lafi na'im. I.e. The people, the righteous people, they are in blessings where? If they believe they are in blessings in the Jannah, this is incorrect. وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ And the people who are transgressors, they are in the hellfire. If you think this is the statement, then this is wrong. What this statement really means, he said, is إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْبَرْزَخُ وَالْجَنَّةِ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْبَرْزَخُ وَالْنَّةِ that a person who is good to Allah, he's changed his life, he's done good, and he's worshipping Allah, and he's obeying Allah, he's doing acts of worship in this dunya, he's not only going to be happy in the akhirah, he's going to be happy in this dunya, and he's going to be happy in the barsa, and he's going to be happy in the akhirah. In the same way, a person who is transgressing the boundaries of Allah, he's not following the commands of Allah, he's not following the sunnah, he's not doing the things Allah commanded him to do, what happens? He is... In Jahim, he's in hellfire in this dunya, and in the barzakh, and in the akhirah. So he's overall unhappy. And wallahi, this is so true. If you just follow the path of Allah, you change your life a little bit, what happens? Your life will become good. I remember not too long ago, I was speaking to a brother. He said, Akhi, when I started practicing, I'm the happiest person I am. Allah gave me the dunya, He gave me happiness. He gave me Izzah, he gave me honor, I see brothers, they give me salam. He said, I got everything just by what? Sticking to the dunya. I'm oh, sorry, sticking to the akhirah. He went to Allah and Allah gave him everything. And I remember my teacher, he met Ibn Uthaymeen's classmate, Muhammad ibn Salah ibn Uthaymeen, you know, the great scholar. His, his classmate, the person who used to be with him in class, my teacher met him. And he said, This guy told me something amazing. He said, look, Ibn Uthaymeen, he went towards knowledge, seeking knowledge, and I went towards the dunya. And I got the dunya, eventually. I got, I got business, I got money, I got everything. But Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, 
despite him going to knowledge and becoming a great imam, a great scholar of this life, he got the dunya as well. But he also got the akhirah. He got akhirah, he got the dunya, he got wealth, he got children, he got married, he got a life, he got a house, he got everything. And I went to the dunya and I only got the dunya, I never got anything from the akhirah. So if you go towards the dunya, what happens? You get the dunya. Uh, sorry, you, get, you went to the akhirah, what happens? You get the akhirah and you get the dunya as well. Wallahi, just try it. Work towards the dunya, start praying your salah, start reading Quran, start attending lessons, start becoming good, worship Allah more. Allah is going to not only fix your akhirah, He's going to fix what? Your dunya before He fixes your akhirah. So that's an important thing. So why the heart? Why are we talking about the heart? We know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he mentioned in a hadith narrated by an Umar ibn Bashir in the hadith where he says in al halal bayn wa in al haram bayn wa bayna umurun mushtabihat at the very end what does he say wa inna fi al-jasad mutqa idha salahat salah al-jasad kullu in the body there is a flesh if you fix this flesh everything is fixed fix your heart change your life everything will be fixed for you as well and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Qur'an, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On the day of judgment, nothing is going to benefit you. No dunya. Nothing that you seek from this dunya is going to benefit you. Not your education. Allah is not going to say what university you went to. Allah is never going to say what job did you have, how many wives did you have, how many children did you have, what did you do in this dunya, did you have fun, did you enjoy yourself? Allah is not going to ask this. The only thing that's going to benefit is إِلَّا مَنْ أَطَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Whoever comes to Allah with a قَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ And a قَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ It's If you look at the word, it's not سَالِم It's not قَلْبٍ سَالِم There's a difference between سَلِيم and سَالِم قَلْبٍ سَلِيم means this The sifa is thabit The attribute is connected to this heart سَلِيم means peace, safety his heart is in safety, he's protected. But that's uh, salama. But salim means his heart is always protected. And this attribute of his heart being protected and in safety will never go away from the heart. For example, when you say this person is alim, meaning he is knowledgeable and this knowledge does not ever leave him. Every time you come to this person and ask him a question, he has knowledge. This person is hakim. This person is, has wisdom. This knowledge or this attribute of wisdom is always connected to him. And it does not separate from him. Allah uses the word, the same word. He says, Salim. Meaning this attribute of being safe and peace and protected is connected to the heart and it never leaves the heart. And how does a person, this attribute never leave him? When a person keeps working on his heart, he purifies his heart. He works in his heart so much that it's almost as if this attribute of salama does not leave him at all. You put this person in the worst of places, but he'll never do one evil. You surround him with this many women, he'll never do anything evil, he'll never look up. His heart is protected, and as the Prophet he said, Protect Allah and Allah will protect you. Safeguard the boundaries of Allah. Pray your salah. Do everything good Allah has told you, Allah will protect you from all kinds of evil. You do not have to worry, you do not have to stress in this dunya, nor in the akhirah. And as Shaykh Salih ibn Usaym, uh, Salih al Usaymi he mentioned in his kitab, Ta'adhimul Ain, the first thing he mentions before seeking knowledge and glorifying knowledge and taking this knowledge, what does he say? Ta'tiru wa al to purify the vessel where the where the knowledge comes, which is the heart. And he said, Knowledge is a precious jewel. It's a diamond, it's a ruby, it's a sapphire, it's precious. It's not befitting except for a clean heart. For a clean heart. So you have to clean our heart. And we have to be from those who have qalbun salim. And the diseases that affect the heart are many. But there are two main things. Everyone, you say, Akhi, what are you suffering from? Akhi, what are you face? What's your biggest problem in, in practicing your religion? Two things. Shubha and shahwa. Doubts and desire. 
Either he has doubts, he's confused, he has a question, he doesn't know the answer to it. Somebody said something, this group is saying this group, he watched a video, it's confusing it. It's shumha. It's doubt. Second thing is shahwa, desires. Oh, yeah, I can't. Women coming, I go outside, I have problems. He's facing problems. Every time he's thinking about his desires. Desires of women, desires of food, desire of sleeping, desire of talking, everything, any desire. Desire of fame, anything. He's always thinking, thinking, thinking about the desire. These two are the problems. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran and he says, Inna we presented the amana, we pre presented the trust to as samawat to the heavens, wal -ard, and the earth, and al jibal to the mountains. Allah said, here, this is a trust, take it. Then he said, فَأَبَيْنَا أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَ مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومَ الْجَهُولَ Allah gave the trust to the mountains, the skies, and the heavens. These three things they rejected. They said, we don't want this in my hand. Allah take it away from us. They said, we're scared of this trust you're giving us. And the human being took on this trust. And Allah says, He was, they had zulm and jahl. The scholars say, the amana here means the takalif. Things like praying salah, fasting, hajj. Allah told the skies, the heavens, and the mountains to take this trust. And they said, we don't want it. And yes, in our religion, the, the, these things are, are living things. The mountains and the skies, they're living things. And they, they even glorify Allah, we just don't hear them. They glorify Allah, we just don't hear them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل جبل لا رأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. If we place this Quran on a mountain, you will see it scared, shivering from the fear of Allah. Means the mountains are alive. So they rejected it, and who accepted it? Us. We took the amana. Then Allah says, إنه كان ظلما جهولا. He had ظلم and he had جهل. And if you see these two things, it's what شبهة and شهوة. Zulm is, is shahwa. Zulm is shahwa. If you have desire and you, you practice your desire, who do you, who do you uh, uh, oppress? You oppress yourself. You do evil, you transgress, you make a sin, you watch things that you're not allowed to watch, you do things you're not allowed to do. Who feels bad at the end of the day? You. Your heart feels bad. You're not oppressing anyone, you're oppressing yourself first. And second thing is, jahula is ignorance. And what takes away ignorance? Knowledge. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says in the Quran, when He sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why did He send him? وَيُزَكِّهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ He teaches them and He gives them tazkiyah. He removes ignorance and He removes oppression. How does He remove ignorance? With ilm. And how does He improve, uh, remove doubts? Uh, how does he remove um, shahwa? So he removes shahwa with tazkiyah, he removes jahan with knowledge. That's how. The scholars, they divide the heart into four types. The heart is divided into four types. We're going to briefly look into it and then move on to the next point. Hadayf ibn al-Yaman used to say, كَانَ النَّاسُ يَسْأَلُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ عَنِ الْخَيْرِ وَكُنْتُ أَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الشَّرِ مَخَافَةً أَنْ يُدِرْكَنِ The people would ask the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم about the good things. So the companions would come, they would say, Oh, O Messenger of Allah, how can I go to Jannah? O Messenger of Allah, give me one word, if I stick to it, I'll go to Jannah. O Messenger of Allah, إِنَّ شَعَعَ إِلَى الْإِسْلَامِ قَدْ كَثُرَتْ The rules of regulations of Islam are too many. Give me one thing I want to stick to, that I can go to Jannah. This is what most of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ would say. But he said, كُنْتُ أَسْأَلْهُ عَنِ الشَّرِ I, Hudayfa, would ask the Prophet ﷺ about the opposite, about the evil things. Why? مَخَافَةً أَنْ يُذِرْكِنْ So I can stay away from the evil. And he mentioned in a hadith, he says, الْقُلُوبُ أَرْبَعَ Hearts are four. There are four types. Number one, قَلْبٌ أَجْرَلٌ فِيهِ سِرَاجٌ 
فِيهِ سِرَاجُ الْيُزْنِرِ قَلْبٌ A heart أَجْغَدُ It is completely empty فِيهِ سِرَاج In it is light and it illuminates this light and this is the وَهُوَ قَلْبُ الْمُؤْمِنِ and this is the heart of the believer the second type is قَلْبُ أَغْلَفْ A heart that is تَغْلِف is when you cover it you wrap it around so it's closed, you can't access it when you wrap a gift, can you see the gift from outside? No. Same thing in the heart. If it's wrapped, you can't see what's inside. All the sins are enveloped and around you. This is This is the heart of a kafir. A third type is A heart that is upside down. And in a narration the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, it's like a kuz that is upside down, a glass that is upside down. A glass that is upside down. So, qalbun man kuz. He knew the truth. He knows this is haram. He knows this is evil. He knows he's not supposed to do what he's doing, but he still does it. And he puts it to the side. He, was, he, was, he knew, he could see. And then he blinded himself. He covered his eyes. He said, later. Imam is saying, Riba Haram. He says, what? Later. Imam says, pants above the ankle. Later. Imam says, you have to pray salah. Later. Everything he keeps pushing to the side. وَهُوَ قَلْبُ الْمُنَافِقُ This is the heart of a munafiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. The third, fourth type of heart is قَلْبٌ تَمُدُّهُ مَادَّتَانِ Another heart is, it's not a mu'min, it's not a kafir, it's not a munafiq. It's a heart that contains two elements. And these two elements are fighting each other. Maddatul iman wa maddatul nifaq. It has iman and has nifaq. And both of them are fighting one another in this heart. It contains both. And they're both trying to overcome each other. One time the iman says, go to the side, get out of the heart. One time the Nifaq says, you get out of the heart, Iman, I want to stay here. So they're fighting with one another. And he says, لِلْغَالِبِ عَلَيْهِ مِنْهُمَا Whatever takes most space in the heart, that is what stays. And eventually, one or the other, if the person lives long enough, will push the other way. You cannot be upon sin today and then expect your heart to be good. And you cannot be good and expect your heart to be upon sin tomorrow or not expect your heart to be upon sin. And there's a statement really and truly, it really scared me. I was with a brother and everybody knows him, Brother Saad. We were speaking one day at night, very late. And I asked him this question, I said, because I'm not from this country, I'm not from here. I wasn't, bo I, was, I wasn't born here, I wasn't raised here, I'm not from here. So I asked him, because I've faced many youth and I've talked to many people and I said, Akhi, Every time I come to any gathering and I do a lecture, many people come after me and they say, Akhi, I have this problem, I have this problem, I have this problem. And I've never faced this. This is not common from where I'm from. It's not common. I said, Akhi, why is this the case? Why is this the case? And he said, he said, sometimes it's because of a sin. A person has a sin in his heart and that's what destroys him. He might not see the effects of the sin today. It might not affect him tomorrow. It might not affect him the day after, but it's the sin. And he said, there's a brother, he went to Damaj. He went to Yemen to seek knowledge. He became a scholar or, or a big student of knowledge. A lot of knowledge. And he said, when he came back, he took everything away and put it to the side. He shaved his beard and he became an atheist. He left his religion. And his family. He said, why? He said, because of one sin that he did. He said, he, he, the brother, he, he, later on he went to somebody and he said, I did this sin. He himself exposed himself. So Allah took away that knowledge and that life that he had because of one sin. It didn't affect him right away, but eventually it affected him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لِيَجْعَلَ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانُ لِيَجْعَلَ مَا يُلْقِ الشَّيْطَانُ فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Qur'an, he will make the shaytan a fitna. He will make shaytan a fitna, a trial. For who? لِلَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٍ For those who have a disease in their heart. وَالْقَاسِيَةِ قُلُوبُهُمْ And those who have a, a, a hardened heart, a hard heart. 
So I'm going to mention a few examples of few reasons why people have hard hearts. And we're going to end, inshallah ta'ala, at that. The first reason people have a heart that is hard is fudul al-kalam. People speak too much. They talk too much. This is the first reason people have a hard heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ فِي الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّهُ الْمُعْرِضُونَ Allah to say, I don't want to خُشُعُ in my salah. I don't feel my salah. I feel like a robot. I'm just praying and I don't feel it. So a lot of people, they come and say, how do I increase my khushur? Right? Everyone wants to increase their khushur here, right? How do you increase it? Don't talk. Don't talk unnecessarily. Allah, He says in the Quran, Surah Al-Mu'minun, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The believers, they've already gotten success. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ Meaning, they already have success. And He mentions after it, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خاشعون. People who have khushu' in their salah, they are successful. After he mentioned the salah and people who have khushu', he says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّهُ الْمُعْرِضُونَ And those who stay away from excessive speech. So if you remove excessive speech from your life, what do you have? You'll have khushu' and you'll be successful, Allah is saying. So remove this excessive speech. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in the hadith, مَنْ ضَمَنَ لِي مَا بَيْنَ لَحْيَيْ Whoever guarantees me what is between his two lahya, meaning this, these two parts. This is the lahya. This is linguistically, this is what the lahya is. That's why the beard is called the lahya. Meaning what's between this is what? The tongue. Whoever guarantees me his tongue. وَمَا بَيْنَ رِجْلَيْ And what is between his two legs. I.e. his private parts. أَضْمَنْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ I will guarantee Jannah for him. You guarantee to Allah and the Messenger وسلم, that you will protect your, your tongue and protect your private parts. What will Allah give you? Jannah. We all want Jannah, right? Protect this and protect your private parts. Protect your tongue. And in the hadith that is always, it's in the Arba'un and Nawi. He, the companion asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, أَإِنَّا لَمُؤَخَدُونَ بِمَا نَتَكَلَّمُ بِهِ will, we will we be held accountable for what we say? What did he say? ثَقِلَتْكَ أُمُّكَ May your mother lose you. It's a way of the Arab saying, of course. Of course. You will be held accountable for what you say. And he said, Is there any other way that people will go to the hellfire falling on their faces or on their forehead? Except what the tongue says. So what the tongue? And Al-Hasan al-Basri, he said, Al-Mu'min, lisanahu min wara'i qalbin. A mu'min, his tongue is behind his heart. I.e. he does not say except he thinks. He thinks and then he says. وَالْمُنَافِقْ قَلْبَهُ مِنْ وَرَاءِ لِسَانِهِ And a munafiq, his heart is behind his tongue. Meaning his tongue is exposed. He will say whatever he says. He won't think about what he says. And the Prophet sallallahu he mentions in hadith مَنْ صَمَتَ نَجَا Whoever is silent, he is protected. You will never see anybody who will regret anything except the person who talks too much. A person who is quiet all the time, he will never regret anything. He will never regret, oh, I didn't say this. Oh, I hated that I said this to the Lord. I made him upset. He will never have this problem. Why? Because he's always protecting his tongue. And some of the scholars say that al kalima thawri a kalima, a speech, is like an, a bull or an ox, a big cow. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like a bull. It comes out from a small hole. فَإِنْ خَرَجَ فَلَا يَعُودُ إِلَى يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ So there's a small hole and a big bull comes out. Once it comes out, it will never be able to come back into the small hole because it's too big for it. It can't go in. And this is what the speech is like. Once you say something, can you take it back? No. You can't take it back. إِلَى يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Until the day of judgment. And that's why the scholars say, وَمَنْ تَأَنَّا نَالَ 
ومن تأنى ما لم تمنه whoever has تأني he is patient he is cautious he is wary of what he says he will get what he wants what is strange is I saw in the in the tarjuma in the biography of Imam al Zuhri Imam al Zuhri in his biography it was mentioned كان إذا تكلم كتب كلام if he said something everybody would write what he said why would everybody write what he said because he didn't speak much and when he spoke he spoke with wisdom. Anything Imam al Zuhri he said, the, the students would always write it. Because he just spoke from wisdom. Now, so the first thing is speaking too much. That makes your heart hard. The second thing is sleeping too much. Fudul al manam. Fudul al manam, sleeping too much. That also hardens your heart. The day and the night were not meant for you to just sleep. Or it was made for you to pray, Qiyam al And Abdullah ibn Umar, when he used to pray, and then he stopped praying al Qiyam, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Na'am al Abd ibn Umar said, Na'am al Abd, he was the best of slaves. Why? Kana yaqum al He used to get up and pray in the night, and then he stopped now. And when Ibn Umar, Umar rahimahullah ta'ala, radiallahu anhu, when he heard this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was said he never missed the Qiyam al ever again. The Prophet told him. Al Hassan al Basri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, Laqad adrabtu aqwa man hum ahras ala uqati him min hirsikum ala dana nirikum wa dara nirikum. I went and I saw a group of people, Al Hassan al Basri, he says, they were more stingy with their time than you are stingy with your money, with your dinar and dirham. The way the people today want to run after money, 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 money. People at those times were more stingy with their time. They didn't spend nine hours of sleep. And if you brothers and sisters really reflect, reflect upon this. Let's say you don't sleep for, you sleep for three hours one day. The second day you sleep for three hours. Only three hours. The third day you will sleep for what, maybe six hours? But you will overcome all the lack of sleep before anyways. Meaning on the third day when you spend six hours of sleep, the three hours of sleep in the first two days, you feel like it was no problem. And I've seen this. And I don't want to do tazkiyah, I don't want to say something good of somebody without deserving it. But our Ustad Rahman Hassan, you know Ustad Rahman, we used to study with him nine classes in Ramadan. We used to start from Maghrib all the way to Fajr. From Maghrib to Fajr. Maghrib to Fajr. And one day, and sometimes what would happen is we're in class and he's delivering the lecture and we'll, I would go to the corner and I would sleep in the corner because I'm so tired. I would sleep, take a nap, wake up, come inside. So one of the other brothers would go outside, sleep, take a nap, come inside. He was always us sleeping. He was always awake. And one time for two days he did not sleep at all. 72 hours, no, 48 hours, he did not sleep. I saw it with my own eyes. We all slept. Two days he did not sleep. Revive revision, he's either giving lectures, either he's studying. Two days he did not sleep at all. And I saw this with my own eyes. So sleep a lot. This will harden your heart. And Al Hassan al Basri also said, Ya ibn Adam, O son of Adam, Inna anta ayyam, you are just days. Ida mada yawmun mata ba'duk. If a portion of the day goes, one day goes, a portion of you is dying. Imagine. I come to his brother and I say, Daniel, can I get your nail? Give me your nail. Cut it, give it to me. Give me your finger. Give me your ear. It's priceless, right? Imagine your time. Your time is more precious. You cannot spend this much time wasting it. So Imam Hassan al Basri said, if you sleep, it's as if you're losing your body parts. Every day you spend, you waste it, sleeping, doing things you don't need to, what's happening? Your body parts are being removed. It's true, because eventually what's going to happen? You're going to die. Your life is just time. After time finishes, what happens? Game over. Right? That's the second thing. Also, there's a story of Ibn al-Jawzi, Allah Ibn al-Jawzi, Allah He said, Ta'amaltu waqti. I reflected upon my time, and I reflected and I saw 
My time was all khayr. My time was busy with everything that is good. I did not find a period of time I wasted. He sat, he talked, thought about himself, he said, you know what? I don't have any free time. All my time is always good. But he said, wait, there's one time that I get, that period of time gets wasted. He said, I have a few of my relatives. They come to me and they waste my time. And the second period of time that I waste, he said, is when I sharpen my, my pens and I cut my paper. Because back in the day, pens and papers were not left for us. It's not ready. For you to write something, to make a pen, you need to cut your pen and get it ready. For you to have paper, you need to cut it get it ready. It's not like us today. Go to Tesco, go to what, what else? As the LD Lido, buy a notebook and it's ready for you. You know, you have to cut your paper. He said, this time for me cutting my paper and sharpening my pen, and the time when my relatives come, they want to discuss things with me, this is the only time I used to waste. He said that I did something. I waited for my relatives to come over. When they come to my house, I use that time to cut my paper. Because it doesn't require anything of him. He's speaking to his uncle or whatever and he's cutting his paper. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. He's doing it at the same time. So he saved his time. And he was wa'ab al-dunya. They used to call him, he was the person who gave the reminders to the dunya. And when he gave reminders, the people in Baghdad and the alleyways, the alleyways, they would hear the crying of the people in the masjid. People, because of his reminder, the crying in the masjid, people outside could hear it in the alleyways. And it is said that 60,000 kitabi, people of the book, accepted Islam upon his hands. 60,000 non-Muslims, Jews and Christians, accepted Islam upon his hands. So this was Ibn al-Jawzi. Third reason is Fudul al-Ta'am, eating a lot. Eating a lot. It's mentioned from Ali radiallahu anhu, it's an athar. Man akala kathiran, shariba kathiran, wa man shariba kathiran, nama kathiran, wa man nama kathiran, fatatu khayrun kathir. Whoever drinks a lot will sleep a lot. Sorry, whoever drinks a lot will eat a lot. Sorry, whoever eats a lot will drink a lot. You eat a lot, when you get thirsty, you drink a lot. You drink a lot, what happens? Oh, I'm so full, I need a nice nap. You sleep a lot. You sleep a lot, what happens? He says, فَاتَ خَيْرٌ كَثِيرًا A lot of خَيْرٌ goes away because you sleep a lot. And for your heart, your heart to be good, you need to have good things going inside. Good things going inside your mouth, good things going inside your heart. And we know the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, about the man who has a long journey. يُطِيلُ الصَّفَرُ أَشْعَثَ أَغْضَرُ يَمُدُّ يَلَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ A man, he's taking all the means of his dua being accepted. يُطِيلُ الصَّفَرُ He has a long distance and his travel is, dua is accepted. يَمُدُّ يَلَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ He raises his hand in the sky. Another reason for his dua to be accepted. يَقُولُ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ He says, يَا رَبِّ And saying, يَا رَبِّ is a way for the dua to be accepted. And he repeats it, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. So, to keep repeating something to Allah or making dua for that is a means for your dua to be accepted. And the Prophet ﷺ says, فَلَمْ يُسْتَجَابُ لِذَلِكَ His dua is not accepted. Why? مَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَأْكَلُهُ حَرَامٌ وَغُدِيَ بِالْحَرَامٌ فَأَنَّ يُسْتَجَابُ لِذَلِكَ What he took inside his mouth was haram. He's eating haram. He had all the means for his dua to be accepted, but what? What he was putting in his food or his mouth is money that was made from interest. It's haram. And mashrab, his drinking was haram. And what he clothed himself was also haram. So what you put in your mouth affects your heart. And if you put too much, also affects your heart. Fourth thing is Reciting the lack of reflecting and doing tadabbur on the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not ponder upon the Qur'an? Or is there a lock upon their hearts? The bal here, sorry, the am here, أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا means bal. Rather, the hearts are locked. Allah is saying, it doesn't mean or. Am does not mean or here. It means, Rather, the hearts are locked because they don't reflect upon the Qur'an. 
And this is so true. How can we reflect upon the Quran when we don't understand the Quran? I say, Akhi, I'm not going to expose anyone. I say, Akhi, what's the... If you stood up on the masjid after Jum'ah Salah, if the Imam stood up and said, anybody in the masjid, can you tell me the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? I would say if maybe four people could tell, or maybe two people would allow a packed masjid, only two people would be able to say the difference. The difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. And every day they're saying, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. They're reciting it every day. They don't know the meaning. If they don't know the meaning, how can they reflect upon it? So you have to know the meaning or the meaning of the Quran. For example, Qul huwa Allah ahad, Allah huwa samad. What's samad? What's samad? Not going to take voice. But what's samad? You have to know the meanings of the Quran and then reflect upon them. Reflect upon them. The fifth one is lack of thinking about the akhirah and the grave. Hardens the heart. You don't think about the dunya. You don't think about the akhirah. You only think you're here in the dunya. You think that you're in the dunya forever. We're not here in the dunya forever. This is a period of time. Burhatun min al-zaman. It's a period of time. It will pass, you will die, you will be buried, you will be shrouded, you will put in the grave, people will put in the grave, and you're going to pray on you, you're going to face the dirt, you're going to be in the darkness. Everybody, me, you, everyone. Could be tomorrow, it could be the day after tomorrow, it could be in one year. Everyone's going to die. Everyone's going to die. You have to think about the Akhirah. And from the amazing st stories that I've, or hadith that I've read is, one day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was praying. He was praying, the companion said he was praying. وَهُوَ يُصَلِّ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ He did this. And they say, after he finished his salah, he said, why are you doing this? What's, what's this? What are you reaching out for? He said, while I was praying, I saw a grape tree in Jannah. And I raised my hand to grab this grape, which is in Jannah. The Prophet is in the dunya. He said, then I remembered I'm in the dunya. Then I woke up. Then basically I started praying. His heart, his body was in the dunya. But where was his heart? In the akhirah. And if we reflect upon our lives, what do we see? A lot of us are thinking about the dunya, not thinking about the akhirah. Another amazing story is Zararat ibn Awfa. He was an imam in Kufa. He was a, he's a tabi'i. He's a tabi'i. Who's a tabi'i? Student of the Sahaba. He's a student of the Sahaba. He read the surah. يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِّرْ قُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَاهِرْ وَغُدْزَ فَهْجُرْ وَلَا تَمْنُمْ تَسْتَكْتِرْ وَلِيَ رَبِّكَ فَاصْبِرْ He said, فَإِذَا نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورِ When he came to the ayah, إِذَا نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورِ When the trumpet of the day of judgment will be blown. He said, if he fell down, and he died. When he read this ayah, he fell down, and he died on the spot. Why? Because he remembered the Akhirah. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, Shayyabatni hudun wa akhawatuha. Surah Al Hud, it made my hair grey, the Prophet is saying. Why? Why Hud? The scholars say because it has a lot of dhikr, it mentions the last day a lot. It mentions the Yawm al Akhir a lot. In that surah, there's a lot of mention of the day of judgment. So it made the hair of the Prophet become grey or white. Jubair ibn Mut'am, he was a Sahabi, he accepted Islam. He came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he wanted to talk to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about his brother. And his brother was held captive by the Muslimin. And he was a non-Muslim at this point. So he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from a far away place, to Medina, to talk about what? About his brother who the Muslims have caught as a prisoner of war, as a nasir. He said, I came with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was in his salah. He was in his salah. He was salat al-maghrib. He said, فَجَلَسْتُ أَنْتَظِرْ I sat down waiting until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he finishes his salah. He said, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reciting Surah Al-Tur, until he reached the part where, he, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, إِنَّ عَذَابَ رَبِّكَ لَوَاقِعَ 
when he reached the part where Allah says, the punishment of your Lord is certain. What did he do? He said, I got up, فَذَهَبْتُ وَاَخْتَسَلْتُ I went up, I did ghusl, I came and I accepted Islam. And I completed the salah behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. One ayah about the Day of Judgment changed his life, made him accept Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is still leading salah and he's still reciting Surah Tutur. He went, he did ghusl, came, accepted Islam, took a shahada, prayed his salah and finished with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one ayah changed his life. Another reason for the hardness of the heart is كَثْرَةَ الْإِشْتِغَالِ بِالدُّنْيَا وَعَدَمْ الْخُلْوَةِ And the lack of having the busying yourself with the dunya a lot and not having time in seclusion with Allah. We all need time to be away from the people with Allah. And not and busying yourself with the dunya. And a lot of us are min al farsha ila al warsha. We are from min al farsha, we are from the bed to the warsha, to the workshop. From the bed to work. Bed, work. Bed, work. Sleep, job. Sleep, job. Nothing else. And Umar would say, Hasibu and Fusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Hold yourself account today before you held account on the day of judgment. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he would have a portion where he would wake up after Fajr, he would pray the Fajr, and until sunrise he would sit and do dhikr. And when he was asked, he used to say, Hadi wudwati, this is my breakfast. If it wasn't for my breakfast, I can't live. He would take time from Fajr until sunrise, spending time alone. He would leave Ibn Qayyim. He said, Ibn Qayyim would say he would leave me and he would go in separate by himself. We do dhikr, dhikr, morning, evening, and come. When the sun rises and comes out, he comes back again and he says, this is my breakfast. What I did was my breakfast. If I don't have this breakfast, I cannot live. Not, I cannot stay alive, I cannot live without my breakfast, which is dhikr. And the scholars say that al-usla, or secluding yourself with Allah and leaving the people alone, he has arkan, he has shurut, he has pillars, he has conditions, but one of them is the scholars say that al min ghayri ayn al ilmi zalla to separate yourself without knowledge is a zalla, a calamity you have to seek knowledge and then take time to be with Allah alone and Ibn Sirin rahimahullah ta'ala would say tafaqqahu thumma a'tazilu seek the fiqh, take knowledge of fiqh and then separate yourself take your time to reflect so don't just go and be and say you know, Yasser said, Brother Yasser said, you know, you have to separate yourself and just take a room, close the eye, close the lights, and do what you want. No. You have to seek knowledge and then do this Muslim. This, the last point is, One of the things that hardened the heart is you criticize the scholars and the people who are righteous. It happens very commonly here. Talking about this scholar, did you see what this stand said? Allah Akbar. He said this, really? You know, he's changing. His manhaj is on. But they're talking to themselves about who? People who have knowledge. Ahlu Salah, people who are righteous, wa Ahlu Deen, and people who have religion. And we all know the ayah in the Quran. Does any one of you want to eat the flesh of his dead brother? You're backfighting him. What are you going to do? Eat his flesh on the Day of Judgment. Eat his flesh. And not just his flesh, he's dead. It's a rotting, smelly corpse that you're going to be eating. And Ibn Asakir, he says, the, the flesh of the scholars must move. If you backbite the scholars, it's not only a dead flesh, but it's poisonous as well. It will affect your heart. And your heart will die because of it. So this is another reason because of the hardness of the heart. So we're going to end the session here inshallah ta'ala to give us some time to go away, do wudu inshallah ta'ala before salah. Anything good that I've said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Anything evil is from myself and shaitan subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, 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 alham
Hey guys, I really hope that you benefited from that video. Before you go, I want to ask you a really important question. Have you guys ever thought about studying Islam and seeking knowledge? If not, then I want you to reflect upon this hadith of the Prophet The Prophet said that seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every single Muslim. Of course, that doesn't mean you have to be a scholar, but you have to know the basics in order for you to be the best possible slave and worshipper of Allah that you can possibly be. So, we decided to provide a solution for this. You see, many people want to study, but they don't have the means or the resources to do so. So we set up an online institute called the Knowledge College where you can study Islam from the comfort of your own home. So if you want more information on the Knowledge College and you'd like to sign up, go to the link below, check out the website, and hopefully we we'll see you on the other side. Assalamu alaikum.